expanding the uh, cancellation of the drinks party, which is grievous to all of us. But anyway, <laughs> nice to see you all here. Um, I'm going to get right to this because we uh, are starting a little bit late. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker this evening for the 2021 Department of History Faculty Lecture. And he is, of course, Daniel Wolf. I've been asked to deliver this introduction because Daniel and I are colleagues in the field of early modern Britain. But Jordan Tobel, as you'll see from this introduction, he's moved well beyond that, that field geographically and chronologically with his work, although I think he still considers it his kind of home intellectually or uh, career wise. As all of us in this room know, uh, Daniel Wolf has had a high flying career in academic administration. I'm going to focus my introduction on his scholarly career, but before becoming principal of Queen's University in 2009, for a decade, he was Dean of the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta and Dean of the Faculty of Humanities at McMaster. I'll refrain from surveying his uh, administrative accomplishments here and, and stick to his academic career uh, because it's quite amazing how he's managed to maintain a serious career as an academic researcher and writer right through uh, an academic administrative career of that uh, intensity. He is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, of the Society of Antiquaries of London, and of the Royal Society of Canada. But he arrived at those lofty heights by way of Queen's University. Some of our emeritus faculty may remember him as an undergraduate honors BA student in history. He graduated in 1980. His DPhil in modern history was from Oxford, where he studied under Gerald Aylmer, and had his viva, uh, his oral examination, uh, executed, I think might be the word, by uh, the formidable figures of Keith Thomas and Quentin Skinner. After his degree, he returned for a few years to Queens as a postdoctoral fellow, and then held professorships at Bishop's University, and then from 1987 to 1999, at Dalhousie. His administrative career began at that point and has recently ended and he has settled back into a career as a history professor here at Queens. That's just ash. <laughs> 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 to uh, list Daniel Wolf's publications would be impossible. Uh, his CV includes five single authored books, six edited collections, and 46 articles and chapters. The productivity is astounding. He is a historian of history, of historical writing, of the craft that he himself and most of us practice, but also of history's wider resonance as a cultural phenomenon. In the first instance, he has studied extensively the historical culture of early modern Britain, and more recently of the globe across a very wide chronological range extending well beyond the early modern period. So his career, in many ways, has reflected the globalization of our discipline. His first book was entitled The Idea of History in Early Stuart England, Erudition, Ideology, and the Light of Truth from James I to the Civil War, which appeared in 1990 from Toronto. His second appeared about a decade later, and three edited volumes later, uh, from Cambridge. It was entitled Reading History in Early Modern England, and is a very highly regarded and innovative study uh, an intricate and fascinating reconstruction of the production, marketing, sale, and consumption of books across nearly three centuries. This was the first of any of the book, Wolf and his life. Three years later, in 2003, came his third book, The Social Circulation of the Past, English Historical Culture, 1500 to 1730. This is probably his best known book. It was awarded the Ben Snow Prize at the North American Conference of British Studies for the best book in British history prior to 1800. David Cressy said of this book, quote, this is not another survey of the development of history as a mode of analysis that became an academic discipline, but rather an original and wide-ranging account of the habits of thought, languages, and media that were molded and nuanced by historical consciousness. In short, Daniel Wolfe's understanding of his subject escaped the high road of intellectual history and narrow disciplinary history and deployed social history, cultural history, religious history, the history of oral culture, the material history of the book. Um, all of these deployed, exploited, to see history and historical culture in the round as a phenomenon shaped by and reflecting broader contextual developments of the early modern period. 
Daniel's two most recent books break out of the confines of early modern Britain and take an even broader approach to the subject. In 2011, from Cambridge came the global history of history, and in 2019, also from Cambridge, a concise history of history. Uh, Daniel has begun to apply his methods and approaches to a much broader sweep of human historical culture. Of the former of these two books, A Global History of History, one reviewer writes, it is, a book, it is the first book written in English that offers a comprehensive survey of the traditions and transformations of historical writing around the world from the beginning of time to the present. He writes further, it's not only unprecedented, but in my opinion, also difficult for anyone to surpass in the foreseeable future. It covers about 4,000 years and 600 pages. Uh, Daniel Wolf, I think it's fair to say, is probably the most credentialed and best known historian of historical writing and historical culture working today. It is thus hard to imagine a more fitting choice to deliver a faculty lecture to the Department of History. The title of his talk tonight is Historical Periodization, a Defense. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that extraordinarily kind uh, introduction. Um, I almost felt I should just sort of stop right there, just with the, with the intro. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, last time we were all gathered together like this was for Tony Delia's talk two years ago, and of course uh, we know what happened to social gatherings after that. Uh, so I'm very, very pleased to see such a lovely audience, including some of my students this, this past term. Um, I'd like to dedicate this talk to two notable historians who died in the past 12 months, both with the same first name, as it happens. The first, Stuart McIntyre, an outstanding historian of 19th century British labor history, of Australian history, latterly, and also of historiography, and my collaborator on a project called the Oxford History of Historical Writing a number of years ago died only about a week and a half ago of cancer, greatly missed. The other Stuart is uh, my late uncle, Stuart Wolf, a historian of modern Italy, uh, who retired to Italy, and he gave me my very first history book when I was eight years old, A History of the World, which I still actually have, uh, so I guess uh, he, is, he is ultimately to blame for a lot of <laughs> Stuart, sadly, sadly died of COVID back in the spring uh, in, in Italy where he retired. So the, the talk I'm giving is an expanded version of a talk I gave at the August August Herzog Bibliothek in Wolfenbüttel, virtually of course, last spring. It's been expanded since and it's part of a, a larger project on aspects of historical theory that I've been working on. In the title, of his final book, the late medievalist Jacques Goff asked the question, why must we divide history into periods? The question was almost, but not quite, rhetorical. Goff pointed out the long-running dispute over the boundaries between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the lack of clarity around them. For Goff concedes that periodization of some sort is inevitable to make sense of a past that would otherwise consist of an endless series of events, something like the vision of the analytic philosopher Arthur Danto, who had this hypothetical idea of an ideal chronicler who is capable of seeing and recording everything that has ever occurred from a Boethian atemporal position of nut stands or eternal now. And that's an ability that Danto himself saw it as not especially useful to a historian. In a way, therefore, Jacques Goff answers his own question in the affirmative before we're very far into his text. Periodization, Le Goff writes, remains an indispensable principle for the historian, even if the globalization of culture and the decentering of the West we witness today have caused its legitimacy to be challenged. He even makes the case more positive further on. Thanks to periodization, he says, both the manner in which human history is organized and the manner in which it changes over time, over the long term, is becoming clearer. 
So what is periodization? The Japanese scholar Masayuki Sato has concisely defined it as a form of historiological cognition proposed by the human mind for making the past intelligible and meaningful by dividing the collective past into compartments a long time. Robert Burkhofer defines it as a rhetorical operation that serves two functions. First, that of defining divisions of time according to accepted conventions. And second, the organization of narrative discourse about the past, such as historical books and articles, such that a text reflects in its internal organization the parts, the chapters, the sections, the defined periodization and its subdivisions. But if periodization is ultimately a rhetorical operation, it is one that does have a tendency to self-reify, making dates and spans between them, quoting Burkhofer, represent more to historians than just their temporal duration or chronological location. And this is not just true for historians. Periodicity is crucial in the social sciences, in finance, and in much bigger chunks, such as eons, epochs, and eras, in scientific disciplines from physics to paleontology, biology, climate science, and geology. Do periods possess characteristics to distinguish one from another, a zeitgeist, for instance, or what some medieval thinkers called a qualitas temporum? The dominant anti-realist, or at least irrealist, assumptions of recent theorists such as Burkhofer, Hayden White, and from a slightly different perspective, the philosopher, philosopher of history, Leon J. Goldstein, would answer emphatically that they do not. To the contrary, this trio believe that such qualities as unity and coherence are entirely bestowed upon the past by the present thereby making periods into little more than longer non-fiction versions of what the Russian critic Viktor Bakhtin called chronotopes, imaginary settings in space-time, authorially created by the historian, and thereby prescriptive of the behavior of the long-dead actors who dwelt therein. Yet, this irrealism was not always the sense of the past and its divisions. Thinkers from late antiquity through Bede, Otto of Freising, Joachim of Fiore, and even the arch nominalist William of Ockham certainly thought that time and its divisions possessed a reality bestowed by God well beyond authorial whim. Scholastic theologians created the Eva, or Eva, as a concept to denote the temporal space somewhere between the psychedelic and the Germanitas. The word was eventually redeployed to describe historical segments such, of course, as the medium item or middle age. The Renaissance humanists who created that division saw such ages as an indispensable context without which words and the events they denoted could not properly be understood. Though for them, the word period denoted a stop or an end, and not yet a duration. In the early 18th century, Gian Battista Vico built on this with his idea of a mode of the time. This bestowed coherence and harmony on the events that occur in society at a given stage in its development and an understanding of divisible, sequential, and distinctive chunks of time was a crucial underpinning of German historicism in the 19th century, in particular the Rankian injunction to judge past societies and states according to the values of their own time and place. Ranke himself insisted that all nations and times were, quote, immediate to God. And the literary critic René Wellick, see in the center there, writing in 1940, seems to have thought so as well. While Wellick decried the deference of literary historians to the tyranny of historians' decades, centuries, and even reigns. And while he conceded that periods should not be treated as what he called metaphorical essences, 
Well, I also believe that periods were much more than simple verbal labels, and that a period could be understood as a system of aesthetic norms providing a regulative function. Now, popular understandings and cinematic representations of periods are, of course, ubiquitous. Stereotypes of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance have become so familiar in our culture that they can themselves be the object of moderately highbrow satire. Consider, for instance, the playful anachronism of Monty <laughs> Python and the Holy Grail, or the now half-century-old Woody Allen line from the medieval court sequence of everything you wanted to know about sex but were afraid to ask, where he declares, I must think of something quickly, or before you know it, the Renaissance will be here and we'll all be painting. <laughs> Generations of historians of art, politics, philosophy, music, society, the economy, and so on, have wrestled with this since at least Jacob Burckhardt, whose characterization of the Renaissance as a distinctive period stood in some tension with his distaste for the sort of era-changing, disruptive events of his own lifetime that augured the arrival of an unwelcome stage of modernity the judgment in which the anti-progressivist Burkhardt was joined by his younger colleague and sometime correspondent Friedrich Nietzsche. In a sense, the Renaissance, while in important ways lying separate and apart from the medieval that preceded it, remained for Burkhardt part of an overarching European cultural unity, a culmination of classical and Christian values rather than a decisive Clinomenic swerve, and my apologies to Stephen Greenblatt for that, towards the modern. Now, a later cultural historian, somewhat in the Burkhardian mold, Johann Huizinga, was a partial skeptic with respect to periods, and was pulled in two directions so far as their function in history. In some passages of his magnum opus, published just over a century ago, Hersley de Middleaen, or often titled the Middle Ages, perplexed by the rigidity of any medieval Renaissance division, Boisinga pointed to the meaninglessness of periodic labels. And by this, he seems to have meant simply to reject firm chronological boundaries. Elsewhere, however, Boisinga insisted almost dogmatically on the necessity of periods albeit defined according to other criteria than mere events. Poisoner's aesthetic vision of the later Middle Ages is notably devoid of markers or events that might constitute a frame for his picture. There are memorable tableaux, such as the famous assassination of Duke Jean Saint-Père in 1419, but there are no key crises, césure, or even iconic transitional events. There's no fall of Constantinople, no Bosworth Field, nor even a northern Petrarch scaling a Burgundian Montfort to Pontou. It's a signal passage from medieval to early modern. The book's changes and mutations undulate and stretch time, but do not break it. And yet, the closing's account is also much more than the depressing sequence of one damn thing after another. Rather, it is a wonderful example of something that the Renaissance historian Randolph Stern, in an illuminating essay, terms normal turbulence, change and modulation within a period, without the rupture or the lurch that would propel one decisively into a new period altogether. Boisinger even avoids turning some of his key non-political figures, Ockeghem, Van Eyck, Brunelleschi, Comin, and Rabelais, whose careers might seem to mark a break of some kind, into anything more than Janus-faced artists marking significant departures from their predecessors while still indebted to prior centuries of practice and convention. Boisinger's book is itself a spectacle or a pageant, his Middle Ages both waning and autumnal, but never fully waned. Its Cheshire cat fading is redolent of words written half a century later by the Colombian novelist Gabriel Garcia Marquez, whose description of a decaying fictional town 
could just as well describe the Europe of Van Eyck and Monstrelet. Quote, the last that remained of a past whose annihilation had not taken place because it was still in a process of annihilation, consuming itself from within, ending at every moment, but never ending its ending. Now, in comparison with authors of Kultukashita, such as Burkhardt or Huizinger, or the history of any visual or auditory art form, the authors of political and military history would seem to have things a little bit easier. They are gifted not only with date-specific events as their principal contents, but also with dynasties, reigns, and of course centuries and decades, as ready-made, fully recyclable packages for that content. But rigidity of boundaries can create a different problem. And while a decade or a century may provide a convenient narrative unit, it of course cuts off many developments in the midstream. It may be asked if the fixation in Western historiography on crises, traumatic and violent turning point events, such as wars, revolutions, and battles, which provide tempting starting and stopping points for our accounts of the past, are not a byproduct of a dominant historical culture that so recently has been highly Eurocentric in its practices and very much fixated on political units, especially the nation state. Now, whenever one problematizes a subject from the past, especially a transformation or a movement such as that from medieval to early modern, periodic markers of beginning and end create inconvenient obstacles for the historian. Stumbling blocks virtually goading the historian to try to move them. Thus, to give only one example, the boundary between antiquity and the Middle Ages is just as fraught as that from the latter to the Renaissance. And Jacques Le Goff reminds us worries over the when of that earlier transition to the Middle Ages induced German historians to develop the concept of the late antique or spät antique, a transitional sub period construed as a hybrid Christian classical phase distinguishable alike from a preceding purely pagan era and from the subsequent early Middle Ages of fully established Christianity and nascent Islam. At the most recent contemporary edge of human history, literary theorists and cultural critics continue to wrestle with the definition of postmodernism and argue whether it differs much from the modernism whence it emerged and against which it supposedly reacted. So it would appear then, as the Marxist critic Frederick Jameson asserts, that we cannot not periodize. Now, I concur with Jameson, but I think the reasons for the inescapability of periodization may be more complex than even he allows. There is good evidence in neuroscience and genetics for a sense of duration, without which we could, of course, have no sense of periods, and of that being hardwired into our DNA. Geneticists have actually identified several genes that govern circadian rhythm in fruit flies, genes with names like clock, cycle, timeless, and even period. But whether because of biology or not, humans have organized time into periods of various sizes since antiquity, even if the primary purpose was originally agricultural, religious, and administrative, rather than poetic or historical. As for the human experience of time, which is not quite the same as its chronological organization, philosophers, historians, and other humanists have attended to that virtually since St. Augustine, and to the ways in which we perceive its divisions. Indeed, this has been very much a hallmark of modernity, as Carl Jaspers pointed out, postulating a post-Renaissance, quote, epochal consciousness of an age of progress, and beginning with Rousseau, of a parallel counter-discourse critical of the values of modernity, one later, of course, echoed by both Burkhardt and Nietzsche. Understanding of the human capacity to draw, fix, and move temporal boundaries has been complicated in recent years by a renewed interest in temporality, or more commonly, plural temporalities as a psychological and phenomenological 
experience rather than as an objective measure and in alternative ways in which time can be broken up, or perhaps even pureed, almost to the extent that it may seem not to matter very much to the historian's craft. Accompanying this has been an extensive effort to rethink the notion of historical time altogether, and to suggest that we ought no longer think of it in a linear past, present, future order. And the so-called historicist chronotype, which presumes distance and detachment past and which leaves the past in the past has arguably been dissolving since at least the First World War. It's been displaced in popular consciousness by a sense of the past's continued and not always welcome presence, what Jacques Derrida in a famous pun called hauntology. There's been growing acceptance of the notion that it's entirely possible for individuals to live in and through different types of time simultaneously. And in one sense, this has always been so. Calendars have long reflected the overlap between sacred and profane, kairos and chronos, political institutional, and personal temporalities. Recent decades have made us much more conscious of this point, marked by a heightened perception of, quote, pasts that will not pass, and of elongated moments of crisis, such as 9-11 or COVID-19. And of course, we do live contemporaneously in different periods, taken as parallel and overlapping streams of events. We're all simultaneously living through the period of a pandemic, and of pronounced global warming, and of a resurgent authoritarianism, to say nothing stories and phases through which we understand our own lives. Our psychological sense of periodicity is often defined as much by emotional reactions, grief, nostalgia, joy, as by rational thought, evidence, or a clinically detached analysis of a historical period's characteristics. Let's return for a moment to Johann Heusinger, who himself pointed out the overlapping of periods, but without fully exploring the idea. Focusing on some of the same themes for which Burkhardt once expressed a preference, those precisely on the frontier between the Middle Ages and the modern times, Heusinger memorably anticipated Jameson's comment about the impossibility of not periodizing. In observing the chronological fungibility of the medieval and the Renaissance labels, the great Dutch historian wrote, quote, far back in the Middle Ages, forms and movements were detected that already seemed to bear the stamp of the Renaissance. And in order to encompass those phenomena too, the concept of Renaissance was stretched till it had lost all its elasticity, end of quote. The opposite, he continued, was also true, as a great deal that might be called medieval can be found in authors such as Ariosto, Rabelais, and Marguerite de Navarre. And yet, Boisinger writes, immediately qualifying his own argument against periods, we cannot do without the contrast. For us, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance have become terms in which we taste the essence of an era as so clearly different just as we distinguish an apple from a strawberry, even though it is almost impossible to describe the difference. This synesthetic image, a recurrent feature of Heusinger's writings, is powerful and suggests that there is something more at work than the arbitrary imposition of chronological time. He was not the first to make such an observation. Chateaubriand, writing a century earlier in the wake of the French Revolution, evinced a comparable theory, substituting for Heusinger's sensory and aesthetic, the intellectual and quasi-theistic, asserting that, quote, in all historical periods, there is a presiding spirit. Hegel had similar opinions, and for him, periodization was anything but arbitrary. The history of the world was for Hegel, as Karl Lewis observes, the history B.C. and A.D., not incidentally or conventionally, but essentially. Other historians, however, have taken the opposite view. 
and de-reified periods, denying them any existence outside the perceiving historical mind. The Victorian historian E. A. Freeman posited a unity to all history, in his case based on a continuity of racial traits, that made periods redundant, though he could not resist simply creating an alternative schema to the one he found wanting in contemporary historical education. For modern historians, the problems of periods are ones of permeability, arbitrariness, and teleology. Simple to understand, but no more readily solved, not least because, unlike our STEM discipline colleagues, our phenomena are neither experimentally replicable nor directly observable. Moreover, periods, like events themselves, are not neat and tidy. The names we give to periods in lieu of centuries tell us different things, often about more or less the same chunk of chronological years. As one recent book points out, the 18th century and the age of enlightenment might refer to roughly the same time span, but with a very different emphasis. Periodic names that dispense with easy convention of the century or decade come with their own challenges too. Their very names often predetermine and constrain our attitude to their content and our understanding of their meaning. The Middle Ages are only middle if we consider everything before and after them as well, and superimpose a progressivist story of human civilization that has been dominant since the Enlightenment. And that period is only truly enlightening if, like Voltaire or Condorcet, we start from a presumption that there was a prior state of darkness that required illumination. Furthermore, unlike centuries, which are arbitrary but not especially value-laden, Periodic names mean different things to different people. To an English literary scholar, Victorian denotes a set of literary texts from Carlyle, Macaulay, and the Brontes to Hopkins and Hardy and the cultural currency that they reflect from the mid to the late 19th century. To a British historian, they mean poor laws, industrialization, and train travel, empire and liberalism, reform bills, Darwin and Spencer, or Disraeli and Gladstone, depending on what type of history one does. As for the general public, the adjective Victorian is likely simply to summon up prudery, corsets, fog, Jack the Ripper, and extreme emotional reserve, <laughs> and to be taken as both characterizing the entire 19th century. Consider, for instance, the commonplace error whereby Jane Austen is not a as a Victorian, despite having been in the ground two years before Queen Victoria was even born. Now, it's become fashionable to dismiss periodization, and it's a lot easier to find critics than supporters. Many scholars across several disciplines appear to feel that periodization's harms outweigh its benefits. The anthropologist Jonathan Friedman, who does not prefer to periodization by name, nonetheless makes it a hallmark of post-enlightenment Western historicity, whereby history is defined as possessing a singular truth about a unified past consisting of, quote, an arbitrarily chosen segment of a temporal continuum ending with the present moment. The archaeologist Dan Hicks, modifying the environmental historian's notion of a current Anthropocene era covering the past two centuries, has disapprovingly renamed our current time as the Chronocene, or as he puts it, an epoch of placing other peoples into epochs. By this, Hicks means the practice of judging modernity by the sole standard of the post-industrial West and deeming the developing world as still dwelling in an earlier age, assigned to Depeche Tachbride's waiting room of history. The implicit teleology of sequential periods, whereby more modern succeeds less modern, is doubtless a trap to be avoided, and one of which scholars of virtually any temporally based discipline are deeply aware. In the memorable phrase of the music historian Julian Johnson, his own discipline has, quote, packaged up the past 
in neat bundles as it cuts through the fields of the future like some great Hegelian combine harvester. The literary critic Eric Hayot argues against the institutionalization of periods in literary studies and points out that periods tend to get shorter and shorter as we approach the present. And I quote, the decreasing size of periods is an effect of what he calls chronological narcissism in which the receding and foreshortened past plays Kansas to our Manhattan. Now, as a couple of my earlier examples show, academics of a more social scientific disposition have often been even harsher than humanists to periodization. Speaking of the privileged status assigned to modernity, and especially Western capitalist modernity, the sociologist of science, Bruno Latour, criticizes that particular period concept of modernity for creating and differentiating itself through the essentializing of, quote, an archaic and stable past. The anthropologist Johannes Fabian, in his enormously influential 1983 book, Time and the Other, attacks the forcing of square peg non-Western cultures into round hole periods that may be chronological, chronologically contemporary, but are envisaged as existentially non-coeval, essentially stuck in checker parties increasingly crowded waiting room. Western imperial societies, writes Fabian, needed new spaces to occupy, but, quote, more profoundly and problematically, they required time to accommodate the schemes of a one-way history, progress, development, modernity, and their negative mirror images, stagnation, underdevelopment, tradition. In short, it's still part of the quote, Geopolitics has its ideological foundation in chronopolitics. And this social science skepticism has increasingly been doubling back into the humanities. Influenced by Fabian, the medievalist Kathleen Davis regards the medieval early modern periodization as a byproduct of long term secularization, or more specifically, of the positivist assumption that secularization and progress have marched forward in lockstep, leaving behind a theological Middle Ages. It is certainly true that a constantly forward-moving modernity inevitably creates and constitutes preceding periods, often in a teleological manner, in order simply to signify its departure from the past. And that's something that's been true at least since the Renaissance. However, this leads Davis to make the bolder and, in my judgment, deeply problematic assertion that, quote, in an important sense, we cannot periodize the past, opposite of Jameson. So, this brings me now, at last, to the defense part that you were promised in the title of this talk. I agree with the philosopher Chris Lawrence, who's on the right, that some of the current antipathy toward periods arises by the conflation among historians, including even Huesega, between issues of chronology and issues of periodization. And that while periodization has been of long-standing practical use to historians, it has actually been severely under-theorized. Reinhard Kosselleck put this even more bluntly. History conceived as ubiquitous, he writes, can only exist as a discipline if it develops a theory of periodization, without which it risks losing itself and boundlessly questioning everything. It's true that there is relatively little literature on the logic, criteria, and minimal requirements of any decision to declare something a period, at least compared with the great deal of writing about the legitimacy of this or that particular periodization scheme. Therefore, I'd like to conclude this talk using the greater precision that the German language often provides, with a brief exploration of both periodisierung, a periodization, a noun, the product of a thought process that reflects on and constructs periods, and on the other hand, periodisieren, periodizing, an action process of thinking through historical change and continuity that produces different periodizations. <laughs>
I suggest that these are not the same thing, but they are routinely conflated in English, and that while the noun is dispensable and ephemeral, the verb or the action is not. So as not to be misunderstood, let me restate that I entirely agree with Lukoff and others that periods can and do distort our view of the past. But then, so do a lot of other things. Availability or selection of evidence. Archival decisions with respect to what to keep and what to discard. Personal agendas or fixations on particular topics. Outright scholarly mendacity. And the everyday politics of the academy. So, periodization sins seem rather modest in comparison with some of these. If periods do distort, they do so only by becoming too rigid and inflexible, by abstaining their welcomes, and by forcing ridiculously arbitrary slot-filling and usually trivial arguments over chronological niceties, such as whether Richard III or Henry VII is the last medieval king of England. Worse still, periods have always been in danger of the kind of reification that Robert Burkhofer cautioned against. Rather than arbitrary mental constructs designed to organize the past, movable shelves from top to bottom onto which events and personalities can be loaded, they become instead essentialized, ontologized, and immovable. And the very rigidity that thereby constrains the meaning of events. Unless, of course, we tear up the boxes and reassemble them in a different shape and size. Like children playing with the literal cardboard box that their Christmas toy came in, rather than the toy itself. Or worse, cats transfixed and paralyzed <laughs> by the feel and shape of cardboard. We can obsess about just how medieval this or that piece of art or music is, or whether this bureaucratic reform or that technological innovation bears the mark of early modernity and thus perhaps should be put in a different box. But here's the thing. Our periodization skepticism has mistakenly fixated on